I've always enjoyed the Halloween season. Mysterious and eerie stories that challenge reason, things macabre pique our interest, at the same time leaving us unsettled. Around this time of year, you can find all manner of spooky stories on the internet. Many of them have been around for years. I wanted to try my hand at recording some odd stories, but instead of repeating things already out there, I decided to rummage through my own collection of photos and old movies to see if there was something I could add. I believe I've uncovered some intriguing examples of the strange, and perhaps a little unnerving. So, turn down the lights, sit back and consider, if you will, the following five tales for Halloween. Sprites, orbs, and streaks in photographs are often attributed to dust, insects, even the rain. Camera settings frequently contribute to their creation. A flash or dark background can make them more apparent. Many times these orbs are associated with people. Sometimes the age or character of the person adds meaning to the sprites. And such is the case when our nephew Will and his girlfriend Corinne came to visit us. They'd come to visit us while on college break. Their visit needed to be documented, obviously, and in typical fashion, I had my camera out at every moment. Oh. While reviewing the shots, one picture in particular attracted my attention. This is the photo. At first I attributed the sprite to a reflection in the room or some odd camera setting. But the more I studied it, the more I scrutinized the streak, the more it didn't fit what was going on in the photo. There had been no flash, the settings and exposure didn't account for the glowing streak. Somehow a glint had zipped across the field of view in a fraction of a second. This is just one of those pictures that will go down in family history as being very mysterious. Hospitals are frightening enough to begin with. Long corridors, restricted departments, and that eerie feeling you get just as visiting hours end, and all the halls are empty, leaving only the night shift. One area that unfortunately never fully closes is the emergency ward. My father-in-law was rushed to this hospital when he had a cardiac event. I was the first one to arrive at the hospital and was directed to the emergency room number four. He received excellent treatment and recovered shortly thereafter. This was the space that a colleague and I were asked to help renovate by my architecture firm a few years later. The new emergency ward had just opened in another part of the hospital. This wing, the old emergency ward, was being renovated for another purpose. It was odd to be back in the same space, but under such different circumstances. Only a skeleton hospital crew remained, as this wing was not yet operational. We proceeded to turn on all the lights in each emergency room 
to help us measure and photograph the spaces for remodeling. For some reason, room four remained dark. The lights would not turn on. We worked repeatedly to get them to turn on, but were unable to. Eventually, we had to trip an emergency light to give us at least minimal illumination. A hospital electrician was called, and even he could not determine the cause of the non-working lights. In the end, we left room four dark and closed the door behind us. I would have thought this just an odd occurrence until my colleague told me that even with the use of the minimal emergency lights, all his photos of room four came out black. Only I have been able to capture on film eerie room four. Tall buildings can trigger phobias in some people. Fear of heights or acrophobia is one. Another phobia is climacophobia, a fear of climbing stairs. Or even bathophobia, a fear of the stairs themselves. Luckily, I have none of these. Besides, most tall buildings have an elevator. One elevator I became very familiar with was an old model in a downtown high-rise that had a great deal of character. It was very old and has openings and mesh portions that allow you to see all the machinery. Although it has seen many years of service, it still functions faithfully. To call the elevator, you just push a button. Then step inside, press the desired floor, and after some clanks, groans, and shutters, it delivers you to your destination. Since I worked on the fifth floor, it seems that this particular elevator had become overly familiar with my habits, as you will see. For whatever reason, I decided to film the elevator one day. It just struck me as so antique. I had pressed the call button and could hear the thing stir deep below me. I heard it rising. I stepped inside the empty cage and noticed that the buttons read floor five and down. But I had not yet pressed any buttons inside the cab. When I looked at the controls, the ground floor had already been pressed. What? How? The cage descended, and I simply watched as the counterweights and cables snaked past. After a long pause, the doors opened and I quickly made my exit. I'm not exactly sure how it was that the ground floor button was already pressed before I entered the cab. This old style elevator was such that a person could not have pressed the button and then jumped out. The doors would simply not allow it. Somehow, the elevator just knew. really enjoy our backyard woods. We have a stretch of dense forest that abuts our property, and we enjoy seeing all manner of woodland animals. Our dogs enjoy it too, and spend many hours out in the yard. For their own protection, we placed a fence around a portion of the yard. This keeps most of the wild critters outside, except for an occasional squirrel or unusually curious rabbit. Not long ago, while the dogs were out late in the night, they were making a fuss at the south gate. They continued this for a few nights, so I decided to set up a camera to get a night shot of whatever it might be. I was thinking of catching a fox or raccoon in action. 
was not entirely sure of the camera settings, but this was going to be a trial run. That night, a photo was taken. After downloading it, I got this. At first I thought I had miscalibrated the settings, but as such there was a pale image. I could just make out one of the dogs in the lower left corner, but there was something else, a shape just visible. So I adjusted the contrast and brightness, and I got this result. What was that? It looked like some figure with shoulders, a head. Whatever it was, it turned toward our dog. Was it looking at him? It gave me chills. I thought it must be a trick of the light or odd shadows, but to have such shadows play across the gate and yard were unsettling. Would the dogs hold their ground between the gate and our back door if nothing was there? I was resolved to try and capture a better image the next night. However, the next night was stormy, and a large tree branch fell directly atop the gate. It took out a section of the fence that was the very spot where the figure had lurked. The dogs have never reacted to anything there again. Was it eerie shadows or a shade? Found footage has been very popular of late, and I never gave the stories and subsequent movies much heed, that is, until I actually found some footage of my own. When I was born, my parents were living in a log cabin in the woods they purchased back in 1965. This cabin had been moved from another location and was built in the 1840s. They had purchased the cabin from an ancient local woman who had lived in it for years. After my mother died, I ended up with some old camera equipment from the house contained in a camera bag. This camera bag. Covered with dust and cobwebs is exactly how I received it. I came across it recently and decided to further investigate. Inside, I found a Super 8 video camera with all the typical accessories and a loose cassette tape. However, much to my surprise, when I opened it up, I discovered a tape already inside the camera. I wondered what could be on it. There was no label and no markings on it. Without delay, I set up a camera to record the display and adjusted the playback to the video camera's LCD screen. I was very curious, what could be on such an old tape? The display showed the 4th of July. I immediately knew what this was. It was a trip to my mother's hometown from about 15 years ago. Here are some segments of the video typical 4th of July stuff. Aunts, uncles, cousins, and such riding go-karts. Apparently the photographer was accustomed to zooming in and out while trying to follow everything. The final segments are some random shots of miniature golf. And there it ends. Or so I thought. Don't... At the end of the footage, I let the static play for a while. Suddenly, there was this. This was odd. What, what is this? For a second, there was an image of my old house. And now it appears to be the creek in the back forest. 
Why would someone record this? Whoever was filming this was wandering around the forest behind my boyhood home. The camera randomly darts around and then fixates on something, only to move on. It seemed like searching for something. Then we turned toward the house. As I watched more, the video panned through the forest in a seemingly random fashion. Could this be my mother walking through the woods? She seems the logical choice. Who else could it be? The filming continued to get more jumbled and sloppier. Who is this? Then, near the end, the filming becomes very haphazard. Focusing on trees, then a fallen log, then rocks, then sideways at a tree trunk, then back to the creek. I was about to rewind the tape to see if I'd missed some detail when this happened. Someone's fingers play across the lens. They do not look like my mom's fingers. She never had nails that looked this way. The camera moved around again, and just as it went blank, there was the glimpse of someone's brow. This was not my mother. Old, horn rimmed glasses? That white hair? Who could it be? I rewound the tape and watched the old footage again. It is bizarre and eerie. The entire segment has this lost feeling, as if whomever is filming is searching for something. Why was this footage buried deep within the tape? If I had not let the static run, I would have missed this odd recording. Whoever was behind the camera never used the zoom feature like my mother did in the 4th of July go-kart footage. So this is the mystery. Random forest shots, glimpses of something, someone's fingers over the lens, an unfamiliar brow with white hair and old glasses barely captured. I was left with unanswered questions and feeling just a bit sad and bewildered. I continued to ponder the odd film of the woods behind the old log cabin. The single rustic photo of the cabin does have one hidden clue. At the far edge, almost out of frame, was the image of the previous owner, that old lady who had lived there for many years. Her image was probably captured by accident. A small, old, white-haired lady who was already elderly in 1965, looking oddly lost back at the camera. I wonder if she ever found what she was looking for in the woods.